You're listening to Widowed Ear with Rosie Gilmoss and Lucinda Boast. We've invited some members of the world's most exclusive club to bravely share their stories. Join us for some honest conversations about living a different life, the crushing lows, the surprising highs and everything in between. Please note this is a podcast about death. Carefully read the episode descriptions and be kind to yourself. But for now, welcome to our podcast. Let us begin. Hello and welcome to Widowed AF. You're listening to Rosie Gilmoss and my special guest joining me today is Laura Malin. Hello, Laura, and welcome to Widowed AF. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for joining me. So Laura and I have known each other for quite some time by the wonders of the World Wide Web. So I have followed Laura's sort of story a little bit, and but this is the first time that we've actually spoken to each other. So I'm very interested to hear your story, Laura, and I imagine our listeners are too. So without much further ado, if you wouldn't mind telling us about Adam and how you met and ultimately how you met in this fairly shitty club that no one wants to be yeah, in. Okay, so Adam and I, we met briefly, very briefly, where I, I was living. He's a, he was in the army and he was posted there. There's a big army camp and and at a weekend as you do go down the pub and meet your mates and stuff and and I'd see him quite regularly you know and when was this so this is kind of yeah 1998 ish time ago you must have been very yes young. well you know I think we'd both sort of had relationships previous to that even so I had my first child when I was 20 and so she was like two or three so yeah, I was still able to to get out and and meet my mates and stuff. And and like I say, Adam went to the same places, seemed to be following me about a bit. But anyway, <laughs> he he denied that. Uh, yeah, so- exactly. <laughs> so yeah, we we had a little a little kiss, and and for some reason or another, probably me, we kind of went our separate ways. So so he went off, and and you know had different postings and things like that. I had, you know, probably another couple of failed relationships, you know, just sort of bobbing along. And it was when my second daughter was born and she'd gone to a, a birthday party and and I walked in and dropped her off. And, you know, at that point, I was sort of hanging around just to make sure she was fine. I think they were, well, about five. And I saw Adam just sat there. And I was like, I recognise him. So went straight over and started chatting and obviously a lot to catch up on. So yeah, we just nonstop talked for the whole party. So completely ignoring our children. But yeah, they were in the thing. It's not often romance blossoms at a five-year-old's party. Exactly. So yeah, it turns out they were in the same class in the same school. They were about a year apart, but I think Ellen, his youngest, was born in September and and mine was born in June. So. Yeah, that was a coincidence. And we then started chatting away and it was mostly on Facebook and, you know, he was in a relationship and then I was in a relationship. So we didn't really sort of get together until a few months after that. So, yeah, when when we finally did sort of, you know, get together officially, I think that was 2010. And it was just, it was just lovely. It was like we'd never been apart. We were always, you know, we'd known each other for ages. We just got on so well. When I did meet him he was going through chemotherapy he'd just finished a course of chemotherapy was that in the 1998 or the 2010 2010 so when you re-met yeah. each other again yeah. so i think the back end of 2009 he'd finished his chemo but it, it was quite aggressive so he had no hair you know bald and no eyelashes no eyebrows but the fact that we had been getting to know each other via facebook and, and messaging it didn't it didn't matter it didn't seem to matter to me at all to the point where you know it was like an elephant in the room but i didn't want to ask any questions you know i thought chemotherapy he's finished he'll get over it job done very naive anyway transpires um that it it, it isn't going to go away it is non hodgkin's lymphoma and he was diagnosed when he was 33 so i think that was his second lot of chemo that he'd had so he'd had remission and then the cancer had come back for a second time so we we you know our relationship sort of fast forward and and we're but quite serious quite quickly he's got time off from 
the army to to recover and things like that. So we we were able to spend quite a lot of time together. He already knew my dad. It, it just it, there was everything fitted nicely. We'd we'd already met each other briefly all those years ago. So that was a bit of a running joke. And yeah, so he he did finish the army. He he did. I think he did his twenty two years. But because of health reasons, obviously, he couldn't continue. And his line of work in the army was quite specialised. So when he was due to sort of leave, he was looking everywhere for, you know, that kind of work because he enjoyed it as well and he was good at it. What did he do? Yeah, he. now you're asking. Yeah, it's a little bit sneaky-beaky stuff. It was electronic warfare, but he, you know, he did done stints in Northern Ireland, things like that, listening in on on stuff and you know, things that he'd talk about and go straight over my head, to be honest with you. But he's a bit of a geek, but loved all that. And and like I say, his brain just was good at, you know, creating things, working things out, all that sort of stuff. So we were down south, obviously. His children from previous marriage were down south. He had an elder daughter from his first marriage up in Newcastle. He's trying to get work where we were, obviously. But that didn't kind of work out. So he left the army in 2012 and then managed to get a job, a very good job up in Lincoln. And he he knew that bit of the country anyway, had been posted there previously. So, you know, well, Laura, I don't, I don't know whether you know this, my, my family are from Lincoln my, on my dad's side. So I've got connections yeah, to Lincoln as well. I so think I remember you <laughs> saying in one of your messages, you know, it's, it's a small world really, isn't it? Yeah, because I'd never heard of Lincoln before I met Adam, to be honest. It, and anywhere for, further than London was north to me. It was like, <laughs> where is that? But yeah, so he he was successful in that job and he, he did commute. He did commute for two years, actually. So he would work all week in Lincoln and travel down south on Friday and go back on a Sunday. And it just took its time. It was one of those things where you just sort of, you do the math and, you know, th- those long journeys so often, I was just dreading it, you know, and I'd worry and, you know, he he was he was actually fine and fit at, at that time. He, he was in remission again and, you know, he's still going for checkups and everything. But again, it's one of those things that you'd actually forget because he never went on about it, never moaned about it, just... and you know, so full of life and, and wanting to do this, that, and then the next thing and plan the next thing. So we eventually, we discussed it a lot because it's a big thing for me to move up there with him. I mean, we were engaged by that time. He proposed in 2013. It was beautiful, idyllic Paris, Eiffel Tower. So, yeah, so, I mean... It couldn't. It, it couldn't have been sort of more romantic, and I actually didn't have a clue. He said it was a works trip, so hey, is that I don't know whether I'm a bit sick or you know, because I, I was joking that I'd come back with something nice and shiny, and I did. So yeah, he was probably <laughs> like very much, yeah, good. <laughs> thinking, shut up, you're a nightmare. But so yeah, it, that that was lovely, and that was you know that was February just after Valentine's Day in in 2013. So we knew where we were headed relationship wise. And I think, I think, although I was, you know, really reluctant, not just because of me, because of the the kids, I have an elder daughter. She was just turning 18 at the time and my younger one about nine, 10. So, well, eight, nine. Yeah. Yeah. So they're very, you know, obviously with the age gap, they're at different stages, very different stages. So, you know, I think, Ashley, the elder one, was ready to sort of spread her wings a bit. And I don't think the idea of going up somewhere far away, very strange, was appealing. When I was a teenager, we used to drive up to Lincoln, obviously, to see family. And it's so flat, isn't it? And we'd drive up there. And my dad would go, are you sure you don't want to move up here? And I'd be like, oh, no, there's nothing to do up here. And I'm just picking. Your 18-year-old daughter being presented with the flats of Lincoln, which are, you know, Lincoln, which are beautiful, but not when you're 18. Exactly. exactly. And she's like, move up there with you. No. No, well, thanks. Yeah. So, uh, bless him. Adam actually took her up there for a week on her own to to sort of take her to the college. And, and you know, I think she was just doing it because she, she was just polite, really. 
So anyway, well, yeah, I mean, it's better than saying F off. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> so yeah, she she then had a connection to Portsmouth in that area. I think a friend was going to plan to go to uni there and they were going to get a flat together and, you know, it didn't quite work out, but she did move and yeah, and it was, it was fine. I was worrying like hell for a long time, but it, you know, she did That's it and me and Alex and, and we moved up to Lincoln, beautiful house. It was rented, very big and spacious because Adam bless him, didn't know how many children were going to come with us or not. So yeah, we, we, we sort of had a little bit of a summer at the end of the holidays to settle in. Adam was at work and, you know, me and Alex were just finding our feet and having an, a look around, exploring. And we went, you know, bike rides and things like that. And and Adam was really good at, at sort of making us more comfortable and, you know, reassuring us that it was going to be fine. Anyway, so we, we get Alex sorted with school and school uniform and stuff. And, you know, she's she isn't like my other daughter will say what's wrong you know but Alex isn't like that she's very introvert and very quiet and thoughtful and and things like that so for her to be quite upset to go to the new school which is totally natural and and I think it was just it all overwhelmed her all at once with the move and then the new school and then not knowing anyone you know and her sister being away and things so yeah, I underestimated that a lot and I was very concerned about her. So, like I say, I went in, you know, made sure that she was settled in class and things like that. And that went on for, you know, a few weeks. And then I think it was around October, November, Adam was in the bathroom and he just said, oh, can you come here? I think there's a lump and I think it was somewhere on his back. I can't really recall now. And I remember thinking, no, (laughs) absolutely nothing there. You're fine. Don't worry about it. I can't feel it. You know, he had another condition, I suppose we call it, where there was sort of lumps. He had lumps certain places, very self-conscious of it. But they're just, they weren't anything sinister. They were just sort of build up of fatty tissue, I think. So, you know, I thought it was one of them and, and absolutely nothing to worry about anyway. It wasn't the case. It, it it was, and it had come back again. So it was the beginning of a very long journey back and forth to Nottingham Hospital. I had no idea because he did joke, you will get to know this journey with your eyes shut. And I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but then going back to Alex, for some reason at that time when we had to keep going back and forth for appointments, she just, she was fine at school. She just, okay, yep, yeah, see you later. And that is, I just, I don't know whether that is just her way of saying, okay, <clears throat> you need to go and do this. I'm absolutely fine. You know, nothing was said and, and, you know, but all of a sudden it just seemed that she was A-OK and just going into school. She might not have been if funny. you were to ask her, but. It's funny how we do seem to find a way of being able to support us when we're going through quite a traumatic experience. I've talked, I think, previously about how my youngest was six months old when Ben died. She never slept through the night. My God, barely sleep through the night now, really. But for about a week afterwards, she slept through the night. Yeah. It was witchcraft. I, don't, I mean, and believe me, it wasn't I was sleeping too heavily that I missed her. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, it, you know, this, I mean, I don't imagine there was a, you know, conscious thought in it, but it felt to me like she was giving me the gift of sleep. And it sounds like, Alex is a very empathetic and sensitive child and perhaps she was able to just pick up on, you know, that you just needed this to be in place so that you could concentrate on, on, on Adam. Yeah, absolutely. It felt, it felt exactly like that, to be honest, like a little bit with dogs that come and lay by your side if you're feeling poorly. All the chemo again and, and a bit of a plan and going to see the consultant and signing all the papers and a bit of an unknown, to be honest. Like I say, Adam had this, this, long-term plan and it was basically to beat the cancer when it came back hopefully with stints of you know four or five years between chemo and and treatment where he'd he'd be able to enjoy life to the fullest and do the things that he wanted to do sorry Nora I'm not very familiar with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma so when you have this condition are you is it going to come back this is something that's going to 
you, you, you don't ever beat it. It's, it's, you just don't know coming and how bad. So with Adam, it's, it was the worst you could get. It was low grade, so it wasn't high grade. So yeah, <laughs> that was one good thing. But it was above his diaphragm and below his diaphragm. There's everywhere in his lymph nodes and it's a blood cancer. So that was, that was why, you know, it was hard to get my head round and I don't think that I really accepted that at the beginning. Yeah, of course. We, we, we know this. We don't want to believe that these bad things are how we, by humans, by nature, are optimistic and hopeful most of us. And you, you like to believe that, no, not, not him, you know, not him. Yeah. We, can, we can beat yeah. this. We can do this. I was going to say, I, I could tell you hundreds of people more deserved of that than this guy and that he's living with this. Like, you're actually living with a death sentence, essentially, and yet you're... You're surfing, you've got your motorbike, you kayak everywhere, you climb mountains. I mean, I think that's what he did to give something back. He did the three peach challenge um, for lymphoma because he just he just faced it head on. It wasn't, I don't think he buried his head in the sand. I think the only way he did that possibly was this long-term plan of, right, I'll get that done and then we'll do that and then I'll get that done again you know, in between these treatments. Um, and also grab what you can out of these, the life that you have. This is what I'm hearing is, you know, the, the things he was doing, because y if you know that you're on borrowed time, you mm. you would want to, you know, literally as a, a mutual friend of ours refers to it, grab life by the badge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm. And, and he definitely did that. But I think he was so busy reassuring everybody else that he, uh, that was his role. That was his role in it. I mean, I, you know, he, he'd have to get his ducks in a row, as he liked to say. So he'd have time out. And maybe that was why he did the, I mean, loved night kayaking. I thought, you're mad. But, you know, it was actually the photos that he showed me, you know, at sunset, old Harry Rock, um, Sandbanks, you know, beautiful coastline. Um, and he was just able to be with his thoughts and, and, you know, get his head round stuff, I guess. So, um, and then come back and reassure everybody else again. So, like the 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 plan was long term to have then a bone marrow transplant, right? Which which would be last chance saloon kind of thing because it can go either way. It can be a cure, but it can be, you know, fatal. So, you know, that was way down the line, way down. And then he said, yeah, something to do with old age will get me first then so it was like oh okay then that that's fine I'll go along and then 2000 when when he was going back and forth and having chemo my poor mum who was down in Dorset she suffered badly from secondary progressive MS and she'd got you know she got a lot when she was only 65 but she wasn't very mobile you know she was she was not the kind of woman to sort of try to help herself that much, unfortunately. She, she, a little bit like me, I need that motivation from somebody. I need somebody to go, come on, you need to do this. She didn't have that, unfortunately. Um, she had carers and things like that. And obviously, when I could, I'd go down to see her. My sister lived nearby. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was a struggle for her. So, you know, she did deteriorate with her m mobility quite a um, and she was so, so poorly one time that I said to Adam, I have to go down to see her. My auntie phoned me and she said, I'm not sure, Laura. And I phoned the hospital and they said, look, if it was my mum, I'd come down. Bearing yeah. in mind, this is like eight o'clock, uh, eight o'clock in the evening and I'm in Lincoln. So I, I vomit down to Dorset, a park at my dad's just to say I'm here, I think. I think it's about one in the morning or something. Um, and then go to Dorchester where she's at, at hospital and I don't recognise her. She's just bloated, you know, she's not responsive, that, that, that it's touching. Um, but then the next morning, by a miracle, she's like, she's awake, she's okay. She's she's made this miraculous recovery. And, and I'm just so grateful that I was there and I could have been there and, you know, to see her get better. Um, so... Mum's in hospital, she's recuperating now and, and you know, obviously getting ready to go home and a care plan will be in place for that. So 
I'm very aware that Adam is up there as well um, and he is with Alex on his own. He is going through chemo still. So, you know, feeling like shit as well. So I, I'm like torn in two. I have to go back up to Lincoln now that I know mum's okay. And then, yeah, it was um, then planned for after Christmas, so early 2015, for him to have a stem cell transplant. And I'm not entirely sure looking back what why that was. And I, all I can think about now is that, you know, there's only so much chemo you can go through. So the, the stem cell transplant, which Adam's stem cells had already been harvested and they were stored at Southampton. Now, again, this is another thing that, looking back, it's shocking, but it it was just the way it was at the time. They had been compromised at Southampton. Oh, no. So they weren't able to use them. So he had to then go through this whole horrible harvesting. I was going of, to say, it's not a pleasant experience at all, is it? Um, is literally wipe your immune system out. And then start from scratch um, after harvesting you know, what you have. And I'm like, how does that work? Like, how does that, how is his stem cells okay? Um, but obviously there are stem cells. So it, it's just, I'm not in any way a, a scientist or, or doctor or, or medically minded. Obviously you pick things up. Um, when you're, when you're, when you're, as we often call it, cancer adjacent or illness adjacent, you have to very quickly an expert in a field that you have no experience in, don't you? Medical jargon, terminology. Yeah. You yeah. know, state cancer. Like suddenly you are a cancer expert or it's, yeah, it's very, you have to pick things up very quickly whilst you're going through a lot of emotional turmoil. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the doctors there, especially the professors and things like that, the consultants, they're, they're very matter of fact because they do this daily, day in, day out. Um, so they don't really sugarcoat it for you and they don't, you know, they use those long words and complicated words. So you, you find yourself Googling everything afterwards um, and still really know further on. But, you know, that was that was the plan. So Adam was happy with that. I said, so that, that was the beginning of 2015. And, you know, we were planning to get married um, first of all. And his elder daughter in Newcastle was getting married in the March, end of March. And he was determined that, he would do this and walk her down the aisle. So that was his focus. And again, a horrible, horrible thing to go through because his immune system was, was wiped out and, and during this sort of stem cell transplant, then to build up. And so you, you have to build up your white blood cells again and your, you know, so everybody that visited, we were in PPE, essentially. Any little bug. So if Alex got a stomach bug, I couldn't go to visit him, you know, so we'd do a tag team with his mom. She'd come up and visit. And, you know, it's miserable for him, miserable. I mean, he, he did communicate quite a lot with messages and, and stuff like that. He was too tired a lot of the time to do that. But I think it was important for him to keep his mind active and, you know, so he'd, he'd do sort of different things on games and stuff like that. So... Yeah, he did what he wanted to do and he recovered and he came home. I think he underestimated it massively because he just wanted to get back to normal. And after that, it takes a long while. And again, I, I just, I think I could have been a bit more like, no, Adam, you need to sit down and rest, you know. There was always so much to do and, and he he really had, while he had so much time on his hands, he'd then plan the whole rest of the year. Um, he was very involved in the wedding, which was great, you know, with the invitations and, and organising, you know, the favours and the flowers and the, you know. So he was on top of that completely. And, you know, the, the programme, when they get their husbands to organise the, the wedding, I would have gone, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Leave that to him. Because, yeah, he was, he was really on it, you know. Anyway, so he was busy doing that. The, the wedding day of his daughter was beautiful, lovely. He was very proud and it was so lovely for her. So then he decides 
right, we we can't rent anymore. I'm going to buy a house. So he had a bit of money left from the um saved up, and then had his beloved motorbike. So he sold that, got a, a deposit together, and he did all this and solicitors and everything. Amazing what you can do from the comfort of your own home. Then we we go along to the show place and and it's a new build house. We choose our carpets and our, our kitchen. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is actually happening. So, and, you know, we go past it every now and again, see it being slowly built up and, and it's good. It's exciting. We move in June that year. So another stress. And then we're getting, oh my God, countdown to the wedding. Like, this is crazy. And we weren't getting weds in Lincoln. So just make ourselves even more problems. Um, we were doing it in some banks. Um, and I think I'd always wanted that as as a little girl walking along the beach and seeing the bride come down and have photos on the beach. I was like, oh, that would be lovely. And I did it. That would nearly. me. So I think the recovery that Adam was expecting wasn't quite going quick enough. And he was still really struggling, really struggling with his breath. He, he was very skinny, very, you know, not not being able to maintain weight very easily. Mm. His breath is, is, is just everything would just wipe him out. And that's not like him at all. So, you know, obviously... He's being followed up with so the stem cell transplant anyway. So we, when we go in and see the, the consult um, at Nottingham, um, and he has a, a a bit of a feel um, around, and I think he found another lump, and it was around his groin, and he was concerned. We were told, I think, after that, I can't remember if it was that day, if he was that sure that day that we were told it had come back. And that was quite concerning because of what I'd already been through. So essentially the transplant hadn't worked. So that was like really hard to get your head around. So I immediately, okay, we have to call the wedding off. We, that that's you, You're more important than that. And he was just like, no, absolutely not. Like, no, this is what I want. And is there any way? And, and the they were great at Nottingham. They'd always been great with him all the way through, <clears throat> but they put him on sort of a cocktail of very, really strong steroids. And that, like, like he was just like his old self again. When the steroids, you sort of get to see the old them a little bit, which yeah. is it's lovely for you, but it's also a false hope, isn't it? Yeah. And and I think at that point, I I just thought, oh, he's better then. He's better. Like I blanked everything else out, I think, because, yeah. Because what you want more than anything else in the world as well. And the human brain will try and protect you. We hear this every time, you know, door knocks and things, the weird stuff we ask. And yeah, you know, what you wanted so desperately. So, of course, you convince yourself to believe it might be true. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, I think you wouldn't, you wouldn't um to look at him at all, the, you know, that he... I mean, it wasn't like he, he had no hair or anything. It, there was there was hair there. I mean, he was going to go bald anyway, let's face it. Bless him. <laughs> I've seen your photos, actually, because I, I did ask you to send them over to me. They are beautiful, and he doesn't look like a sick man at all. No, it, it's it, it's so cruel. And I'm so grateful that he had that, that he had that to to enjoy, and, and no one was treating him like, you know, Right, do you, do you want to sit down, Adam? Or we were doing shots, you know, right. dancing. It was, you know, there was an ice cream boat that came up to the sea. This is cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all that that sort of his idea. And, and the great thing was because that happened when you were just at the beach and it was a Benny Hill theme tune. And this, this sort of boat would come along and you'd sort of stop him and get ice creams and things. So <laughs> we got tokens for all our guests and that's what they did. And it was it was just so lovely. Everybody was paddling and, you know, the kids were in the water. It was just such a lovely day. You said that you were really glad that he had that day. And I yeah. just wanted to just interject, sorry, that I'm also really glad that you had that day because you get to hold on to that memory. And I'm, you know, presumably, you're, I know you've got pictures. And, and just, yeah, he, how lovely to have that, that, that memory instead of just the memory of him being sick. And I think yeah. that's... It's lovely that you did get to have this magical day that you wanted. Yeah, I mean, I I look back and I think I'm 
really grateful that my mum was able to be there as well um, because she, like I said, was poorly before, seemed to go in in sync with Adam. I was like, Mum, is this a conspiracy? Like, I can't be in two places at once, seriously. <laughs> Would you not? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But it just seemed like that was strange. But she was determined to be at the wedding. So she, you know, bless her, she got everything ready. She got her outfit and, you know, she was doing her exercises and things like that and just, you know, that was her that was her focus. So that was really good. Um and she she did get a lot better and she was there with her carer who was amazing with her. Um her purple hair just especially to go with her outfit. Amazing. Um and I remember walking down the aisle with my dad. It was only a short aisle because we were in a hotel, but as soon as I walked in, I heard her just go <gasps> Oh. And she burst into tears, and oh god, I just like I be said, me done, Laura. Yeah, I said I had to leave Dad standing there, <laughs> and I went over to her and I just gave her a hug, and she went, "You look so beautiful." I was like, "Oh my god!" So yeah, it was that was looking back for me that I'm so grateful for that. I really am. Um, so yeah, lovely, lovely, and then the honeymoon was a patio instead of an actual honeymoon because. We couldn't go anywhere. His immune system was nil. So he had he had to have his vaccinations again before that happened. So we spent the money on a lovely patio, which was lovely. Well, I thought you meant that you sat on the patio for your honeymoon. I'm thinking, oh, they sat down. <laughs> you actually got a patio. No, I bought one. Yeah, yeah. That's I wholeheartedly approve. I'll take a nice yeah. home improvement. Yeah, whatever, yeah. That's fine. So, you yeah, know, um, and, and Adam, like I say, wanted to have a little think about things. So he went to, I can't remember which coast, whether it was like Filey or somewhere like that. Um, he took his surfboard. I don't know how much of that he did, but he went to them um, for a few days just to get his head together um, and have a think about things. And my daughter, elder daughter, came up from Portsmouth and she stayed with us. So that was really nice. And yeah, it... It was a bit of an odd time, but, you know, you do what you've got to do. So it was, I don't, it's hard to recall what exactly happened between that time and then leading up to, because the next plan, obviously that not working, the stem cell transplant not working, that next plan was to get him ready for a bone marrow transplant. Right. Now, again, looking back, having those two major things happen within a year of each other, you know, you, you ri- you're taking a massive risk. Yeah. And it didn't compute. It just didn't compute. And I think it did with Adam, but we didn't talk about it. And I couldn't talk about what might happen. What so, is? Yeah. So the transplant was, oh, he had a match with his younger brother, which was amazing. So there was none of this sort of searching high and low and things like that. Was, that was a big weight off. So that was scheduled for the 2nd of December 2015. And again, my mum, I think we, I spoke to her regularly. She seemed okay. She was obviously there's not a lot she can do when she's a bit sort of stuck at home and things like that. But she was in good spirit. I was telling her what was happening with us and things like that. And she was always concerned about Adam. She thought the world of Adam. It was a bit bizarre because I think she'd been in hospital because she, she'd been a bit poorly since the wedding. As well. So she'd had a stint in hospital, I think. And then she'd come home. And I was always worried that she she was discharged too early and, and she was at home and it was I think Adam had been in hospital so we thought fast forwarding sorry to December now and Adam had been in hospital he had his transplant and he was then recovering from that and so yeah he, he was okay he was still with it. it was but he was very very fatigued and and poorly and I think just coming to the peak of of this horrible side effects of everything that was going on and I'd gone swimming that day with my daughter my younger daughter we were just going to Sainsbury for something I can't remember what and my mum was ringing my phone I saw it was my mum I was like okay I'm just at the checkout I'll shut her off and then I'll ring her back um 
And then we got into the car and it rang again and it was my sister. And she said, she just said, mum's died. And I just let out this really weird scream. I'm just like, I, cr- I couldn't believe, like, I couldn't believe it. Like, what? And a- Alex was beside me and she knew exactly what had happened before I'd even said anything. So the first person I phoned was Adam. And I told him, and, and I don't know, just talking to him was enough. You know, obviously he wanted to be able to cuddle me and, and comfort me and things like that. There's not an awful lot you can say um, after something. But he was ringing around friends and things like that, asking friends to come and see me and stuff. And I was just numb. I just remember getting home just really numb. And I didn't particularly want anybody to come around at that point. But this this friend, I say friend in a loose sense of the word as well, she did come around. And... She did not know what to say either. So it was very awkward, like 10, 15 minutes. And then, you know, I was just like, honestly, I'm fine. You're not fine, but you are. So, yeah, then then it was obviously phoning the family around and everybody's spread all over the place. And poor Adam is still in hospital. He's getting worse because of all these um, drugs that he's been pumped full of. It, his levels of this are going up and then they're going down and then he's taking on too much fluid and then he has to have the you know pills to d- the diuretics to to get rid of all this fluid and then he's constantly on the toilet and he's it's just it was just awful what's his mood like at this point laura how how is he mentally i think he thought he was going mad because mm. he was hallucinating like mad he was seeing people at the window he's on the third floor and he's seeing people that he thought that the drip stand was somebody, you know, in his room. Oh, poor guy, because that must be terrifying to think there's somebody yeah. in the room at the window. Yeah, he's done, things were moving. It, it just made no sense. His, his messages were very jumbled and very, like he was drunk, you know, and his his good friend was saying the same, that he was just getting very, very odd messages from from Adam. And like I say, I, I, when I did go to see him, I wasn't able to touch him. I had to sit at the end of the room with the PPE on, and I was, I was, I was empty of words. I was grieving my mum. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't help this man. And couldn't you? As yeah. well? um, your mum's just died, and your husband. You can't. You know. Yeah. I, that's just that's so sad. Yeah. And I know that that was heartbreaking for him not to, because he did a, he was doing a blog about his fourth c- cancer fight, you know, mm. and he mentioned that and mentioned that all he wanted to do was come and give me a hug and he couldn't. So I knew like that was sort of when it had happened. So the 6th of December after that, he just went downhill and he did, he did know that my mum had died, but he was so, he just, it was his fight for survival. He was fighting for his life at that point. Mm. And I didn't understand that. And he knew that because that's his body. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I don't know how else to explain it, but you you would know, I guess. Mm. I mean, it's hard for you to probably answer this, but I mean, at what point do you think that he gave up hope? I mean, it must be, I can't imagine being in a position where I'm staring down the barrel of death. And for these people who, you know, are given these terminal diagnoses and then, I mean, did he, was, did he know? When did he accept it? I mean, sorry, you know, I might be asking you a question yeah. I can't answer, but I am genuinely interested. But this is the thing because of what was sort of overlapping with what he was going through. It, it was something that was not discussed. I was trying, you know, trying to get through the next day and the next day and, and not really sort of concentrating too much on on what he was, well, he wasn't saying anything. That was the point. He was actually physically so tired, he couldn't type. Oh. He couldn't type the message. He was curled up in the fetal, fetal position when I'd go and see him most times. And I just, yeah. So he, he couldn't, he wasn't. I don't. I don't think he was that aware. Maybe. Um, certainly, I don't think he ever gave up. 
because that's not him. I I think obviously when it went really wrong and that was after New Year and, and that was the 6th of January, I got the call in the middle of the night because he couldn't breathe. Uh, there was fluid on his lungs and, and he couldn't breathe and I can imagine that is the most scariest sensation for anybody, you know, along with along with a lot of other things, but when you can't get physically get your so yeah, there was a lot of moving about and when I got I got a lift to the hospital from Adam's friend and his wife stayed with Alex and then I I went to, to see him and, and he had a, a mask on, oxygen mask on. And he just, he just looked so scared, so, so helpless and so scared. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Like I was, I must've been in shock because it was the middle of the night and I didn't know, understand what was happening. So he was moved then to a room just before I see you, um, to be put on a, I think it's a CPAP mask. It's a, it's a force of oxygen. Um, it looks like, you know, Top Gun. I know this John had one. Mm. COVID. And yeah, so I I think that that when they put that on him, his eyes were just like that because he couldn't take it all in. Mm. Like that was being forced too down much. him. Yeah, it was too much. It was like, you know, drowning almost in mm-hmm. air. So that he took he wanted to take that off and, and they went back to the sort of the oxygen only. And then he started coughing. And he couldn't sort of cough anything to clear it. There was just so much gunk. It was just sounded awful. And then all of a sudden, all this blood came out. And I was just like, oh, my God, I screamed at that. I tried to get a bowl to, to help him. I felt, I felt so small and helpless. Like, I just screamed. I didn't do anything helpful. And then this nurse was quite calm. And just, you know, try to get the mask back on it. And I'm like, he's covered in blood. What are you? And then I was, luckily I was taken out and all the doctors came in and they had then sedated him. And yeah, I, that's when they, they took him in. It seemed like an age. I was waiting in the waiting room. Um, but they obviously cleaned him up, got him comfortable, put a tube down there and moved him to to I think it's critical care is what it's called there and so I was able to go and see him not communicate obviously because he was sedated so it was just it was yeah just shocking to recall it because it didn't feel like it was real it doesn't doesn't, it feels like you're living somebody else's life or in a tv program you you cannot you know it's happening to you 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 can't you still can't believe it. You feel like you're in some sort of weird alternate universe, don't you? Yeah, yeah. It was. It just felt like I was looking down on it. Yeah. And the nurses were great, and the doctors were amazing. And they said quite early on that I should start a diary. They didn't know how long Adam would be in there. They obviously don't want him sedated for their very long at all. But they can't do a diary they've got no time they're literally snowed under so all this beeping this the machines the the numbers on it the you know and they're saying about his oxygen levels and you know um and strangely looking back I just hung on to all those numbers and didn't really really make any sense of them just oh they're going up but that's the sedation well, being priest or a medical degree in this brief period. Yeah. Oh <laughs> God! And I, was, I have the diary now, and it is there just to sort of talk me through it a little bit because it is like I was never there, um, apart from this this book that I think it was there for three weeks. So was able to write something down each day, and I'm I'm glad I did that. And I was doing it to show Adam. Yes. But yeah, I think quite quickly after that, his brother and sister-in-law came up. His elder daughter came, so I wasn't there all alone. I, I wasn't. I had support, which was good because obviously Alex was still at home. That's all a bit of a blur. I did call my dad and said, "I think you should come up." 
Um, so he dropped everything and he came up to be with Alec. Yeah, I mean, he he's he was just he's been so constant and strong with my mum, even though they weren't together, and and then with Adam and stuff. And he was so totally out of his depth. I, I, I have a super dad as well. And yeah. I will never forget. He, him and my mum are together and they're both amazing. But I just, yeah, it, it's, it's, I'm hearing lots of really amazing dads in these stories, actually. And I suppose it's, they step into the protector role that's been vacated by your husband or your partner. Yeah. But yeah, dads, shout out to the dads, eh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm very lucky. I do have a great one. So Laura, talk me through a little bit. So he's now, he's in critical care. You know that it's, you know, that there's only one outcome, presumably at this point. So it's, is it pain management and, you know, palliative care now? That That's the thing, because I seem to have, throughout our relationship, been waiting for the cancer to come back, essentially. Um, and each sort of checkup, when it's been all clear, it's been, yes, great. But when is it going to come back? I know it's going to come back. And I could kick myself for doing that, but that's just what you do. Then when he's there in in the state that he's in, I'm thinking, oh, he's going to be fine. This is life changing. Yeah, yeah. This is life changing, but that we're going to do this. You know, we're going to have to sort of sort the house out, you know, turn the garage into a bedroom. Like, well, we can do that. We can get him a wheelchair and stuff. Just temporary, just Bargain until he... Absolutely, totally. And I just remember there's a thing in the diary and I keep, I put, just let him rest. Mm. Just that he's not ready. Stop trying to take him off the sedation and let him rest. He needs to, and I had no idea. He's just getting worse. He's not getting better. He's, he's getting worse. And he had fibrosis on his lungs. Um, the, the, there was no trace of lymphoma. There, this, the damage, the damage was so bad. It, they just, um, his dad was saying, "What about a transplant, a lung transplant?" Mm-hmm. It's just impossible. Couldn't do it. There is just no couldn't do it. Much the human body can take, and it, you know, it sounds like he had a lifetime really of, of, of chemo and procedures. And yeah, we, yeah, we are I mean, human, aren't we? Exactly. And his his lung capacity was not great, and he didn't let on that it wasn't that as great as it was. And, you know, he would joke about being the size of raisins and things like that, you know I mean? But... Humid reflect, yes. We know yeah, how. Yeah, definitely. And, but again, still, you sort of have that hope. So I went into the hope mode and just to protect myself, I think. So it was a, a, a days of, right, his oxygen, he's breathing a bit more on his own. That's great. We'll hang on to that a yep. bit. Then he, you know, he's been very irritated by the, the tube and, you know, there's a lot of fluid on there. So he has to be suctioned a lot. And and then they want to have a look at where the tube is positioned because they think that's irritating him. They can't do that and, unless they get him to a theatre somewhere. He, he is so unstable, they can't take him off the oxygen long enough to get him to that situation. Even then, I should have been, okay, this is really bad. But no, I was just like, well, okay, try again then. Well, what you, um, you've told me in some of our sort of correspondence before then that you have a tattoo that says, I won't give up. And it's written in his hand, actually from his ashes, isn't it? Because it was one of his sayings, which I think is really uh, touching, actually, and a really nice sentiment. And I'm not sure I knew you could do that either. So that's you, you taught me something. Yeah, and the, I mean, this is this is like the theme running through this whole conversation with you is that neither of you are giving up here. Like you, you just won't accept mm-hmm. it. <laughs> it's not happening. And uh, that's that's the thing. And that was the the song I walked down the aisle to, Jason Raz. I won't give up. Mm-hmm. So you know, and that was you know, in Paris when he proposed. He he did a recording and he put the earphones in my ear. Oh, and he recorded and the the song going again uh, along with that was that song i can't find the bloody recording but oh yeah so that it means i know i know and uh, everything had a little 
extra edge to it with Adam. So a little bit more thought. Right. He does say sounds like a really amazing man. Yeah, definitely. So look, so, I'm yeah. going to ask you now, if you don't mind, just to tell me a little bit about the very end. I know it's really difficult and I hate dragging you all back into this, but it, it's why we're here to go through this cathartic process. So if you wouldn't mind just telling me about the very end. So uh, by the end, his mum and dad and, and me and his mum are sleeping in the hospital hotel. Um, and it, it's it's the morning and Jill, his mum, got up super early. For some reason, she just wanted to go and see him. And so I get up and I get down there by about, I don't know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And she's been told already by the nurses that Adam had a really bad night. Mm -hmm. They had um, performed CPR on him um, a couple of times because he had heart failure. And even then, even then, I was like, oh, God, okay, is he stable now, though? You know? What time's tea? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I was just like going through this routine of going to see him. And having a shower and then blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the whole let's take your family um, to a room. We need to tell you. And, yeah, it. I think I think I walked out. I think I got upset and I walked out because it, there was no hope then. What? There was no hope yeah. anymore. Well, that again is very hazy, but it was very, they never come out and say it as it is Mm. but I think it was more uh, along the lines of you know his organs are failing Mm. Um, we tried everything yeah you know they started talking past tense that sort of yeah yeah Um, but we will make him as comfortable as possible Mm. you know Uh, so yeah I just remember thinking right if that's what you're saying to me I want to be with him now so um, I went back to the room and um, yeah it was it was a, a very odd day because obviously we had to then tell people. So where he was in, in, in his room, there was his mum, there was me, there was my elder daughter, his elder daughter, his brother, his oldest brother and um, his sister-in-law. So it was quite a, a lot of us, which I know Adam would have hated. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like, bugger off, will you? But his dad and his younger brother couldn't bring themselves to do that that's fair, absolutely fair and yeah they they the nurses obviously you just almost like forget that they're there because they're like angels floating around just tweaking this and tweaking that and very quiet and just so like you don't mind that they're there you know and they they began to switch off things and 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 his mum sort of got up and walked behind the bed and started sort of massaging his temples and sort of brushing his hair back and and just sort of reassuring him that it was going to be okay and that it's okay he can go and he you know like I think she mentioned something like he'd be surfing and and things like that just it's it's fine it's fine um I just held his hand and you know it's just we were I think it was it was special that we were all there with him, you know, and that was, I think that was 25 past six, uh, uh, 29th of Jan. Yeah. And, and I was able to stay with him a bit, a bit longer on my own after that. Um, it's quite poignant, isn't it? That his mum stood and stroked his hay mm. and that brought him into the world, stood and held him at the end. And that's actually making me choke a little bit. And I can see that you're choked up, which is not happening. <laughs> But, you know, as a mother, the, the idea of having to stand and hold your child while he left the world, it, yeah, it's barbaric. Yeah. It? And, but I think the idea that you've held his hand and his mum held his head, I think, you know, if, if you've got to go, you want to go yeah, like, away. You want to go like that. You want to go held and loved. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you in this sort of, this journey that we're all going <laughs> I used inverted copy yeah. because I do it every time because I'm a sick of Yeah, the that, <laughs> there's so many this it's just tragic stories um heartbreaking story of that sort of thing you know but in such different ways and a very abrupt very violent very sudden and that's it you don't there's no 
there's not even visiting. You don't get to say anything anymore. That's it. And I know that's your situation, Rosie, and I can't imagine that. So it's 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 so sort of you have to open up to all sorts of things. And I think that's where, you know, listening to the podcast is is just so invaluable to everybody going through this. And people that aren't, maybe people that need to support another person. And I think really... that we will all experience grief. It's unavoidable yeah. part of living. And if you're in a romantic relationship, one of you is probably going to die first. So you're either yeah. going to be widowed or your partner's going to be widowed. So the more that you can learn about what it's like, the better you can be prepared for if and when it happens. Yeah. Um, it's really lovely to hear you say that, actually, because I very much hope that what we're we're creating is is this sort of almost like a, a not a guide but a, you know a, a reassurance that whatever you're going through somebody else may not have experienced the same thing but I noticed so many patterns in people and and you know, every story is so unique but the the consistent thing I see a lot of is how people respond to it and I know that you have managed to gradually rebuild a new life for yourself haven't you and as have I and as have many of us and it's all you know it's hard. It's bloody hard because some days I don't want to climb that mountain. The, the common theme I see in what I describe as, you know, the survivors of this, the people that have come out, walked through hellfire um, and created a life for them. And it's not the life that we thought we'd have, is it? None of us are living the life that we thought we had, but most of us managed to carve out some degree of a good life. And I wondered if you would just just tell me a little bit, just, just brief a little bit about what, what your life looks like for you now, Laura. I'm lucky enough to have met somebody um through this horrible crappy club that we all belong to so, so he's a widow as well yeah chris is a, a a couple of years more than me but his although we have that in common um our relationships previous relationships um spouses are very very different very different backgrounds so but because chris is is quite similar to adam in in the way that his nurturing and caring, protective, and yeah, even though how we met was a bit of a car crash, to be honest with you, with, from my point of view, a bit too, a bit too much, you know. But, you know I think it was so. Adam died end of January two thousand sixteen, and I in December had a work do, the sort of first time that I'd gone out and about, and. I think in end of October, November time, Chris and I had sort of messaged briefly on the widowed and young. Yes, yes. Yeah. Maybe and John met. Sounds a bit like a dating site. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Just... And they always, <laughs> they always make clear that it's absolutely not. But how yeah. can you, that, uh, you can't help that, can you? I just was looking at the other widows, whether rightly or wrongly, in my area. It's just a bit yes. of interest. Support network, right? Yeah, as well. Exactly. Um, and he's, his photo ca came up in, it's just the most idyllic photo you've ever seen of a family, which makes it even more tragic and horrible and, you know. But there's him and um, four kids and they're all very young. They're in a swimming pool. There's a bloody dolphin there and, and his wife is, like, lovingly looking over them all. And it's just beautiful. And he commented on my photo, which was one of my wedding, me and Adam. And we just sort of obviously wanted to say how sorry we were for the other's loss and and then it started like that and yeah he he wasn't so au fait with the messaging side of things he doesn't have facebook he's you know he doesn't really like social media at all but so yeah i i, I kind of made him you know message a little bit more so we could communicate more than anything anyway so i go out um works do and there's a few glasses of wine going down it's it's I'm enjoying myself um and then I think oh it's a good idea I'll see if Chris wants to meet for a drink because of course why wouldn't he you know yeah and all good decisions are made after wine no, all good decisions and I'm thinking it's only half ten well by the time I keep negotiating with him because his youngest child his daughter who's 15 at the time she's in bed he's mm -hmm. like I can't leave her I was like oh no okay I'll tell you what, I'll come to you. He's like, I don't really think that's a good idea. Oh, go on, go on. I'm literally begging. It's it's very... <laughs> well, 
so, you're drunk and grieving. That's, that's your excuse. No, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's time to go home. We're all happy and merry and everything. And I'm like, right, taxi. Laura needs to be dropped off. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll go. I'll be dropped off there. Thank you. Oh. I have no idea really where this man lives. I've got a brief recollection. Um, so it's I, I give him a, a quick call. Um, yeah, I'm on my way. The yeah. He just says, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, and, and his house is down a long lane. So thank God he came to meet me. Otherwise, I, I'd have been, you know, in a hedge somewhere. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I stumble up and, and he makes me another drink because I think that's a great idea as well. Yeah. And then we're talking and I want to see his wedding album, you know, and then I get a bit teary and then... I decide to, you know, go in for the kiss. Oh. That's also a great idea. Um, and honestly, he's such a gentleman. He doesn't make me feel stupid or anything. It's just like, no, I don't think that's a good idea. So, okay, yeah, let's let's go home. That that'd be good. And then his eldest son comes home from a night out. We're, we're bearing in mind we're talking one or two in the morning. Yeah. Oh no, it's a good idea. I'll stay a bit longer. Uh, you know, thinking I'm the life and soul. Anyway, so. Yeah, he eventually gets me out into the truck and takes me home to my house where my eldest daughter is very worried about me at this point. And she opens the door and says, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm sort of stumbling by my garage laughing and thinking this is hilarious as she is livid. It's just roles reverse completely. Oh, my oh. God. And luckily, we can laugh about it now, but we did not at the time. So. Well, Laura, if it's any consolation, I got horribly drunk the first time I took John out and he dropped me back at home. And then he went home to, he dropped to drop the babysitter home, at which point he was pulled over by the police because, you know, older guy, young girl in the car. Yeah. They'd oh, pulled, wow, wow like, really? Like, and we're sort of checking if she was okay. And I was thinking, oh my God, this isn't how first dates are supposed to go. <laughs> <No. laughs> But oh, this is, I God, think, yeah, exactly. I think that is a good sort of measure of, of how it's good. It's un, unforgettable, basically. Well, we, so we didn't then go to a musty to. performance, did we? They got the, yeah. the real authentic message. Yeah, and I think, oh, God, he's not going to really want to know me anymore. Oh, well. And, yeah, yeah, he wanted to meet for coffee the next day. So. He sounds like a keeper, Laura. I'm yeah. very... I do think that relationships with people who've also been through bereavement, it does give a level of understanding and compassion. And, you know, they do get it if you need to rock back and forth in a dark room and cry yeah. about your for a bit, whereas not everybody does. No, and not all widows, I don't think, welcome the fact that you want your pi pictures of your <laughs> late husband or wife and that you still love them and that it's absolutely fine to do that and grieve still and cry still and... So and he does and I him. So that's when I met Holly, uh, when John was in hospital, um, Holly had a cushion and it had her mum and dad's face on. You know, somebody would have made it for, and her mum died. And I was sharing. I was sleeping in the middle of her and Hector at the time because you know mum life, mm -hmm. right? And um, I used to regularly wake up the next morning and have Sarah, John's first wife's face, just like right <laughs> in my face. <laughs> and I thought, this isn't this isn't how normal people do relations, that's is it? You know, as you wear Sarah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it is. It is one of those things, isn't? I don't know how we've done this, but we've managed to not have too many faux pas in that department, you know, because I was so worried that I'd be calling Chris Adam multiple oh, times. Oh, to his face, but I do it when I'm retained. When yeah. I'm telling stories, yeah. I have to bring a wrong husband. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I was thinking, no, no, don't, don't, don't. And I've never done it, weirdly. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I've done it to some, you know, relaying other stories to other people. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not that. Yeah, you do. And so yeah. it depends who it is, whether they sort of laugh with you or look yeah. at you and be aghast. Yeah, they, exactly. They, they, but, oh, bless. But, yeah. Well, we've certainly ended on a high, Laura. I do like to yeah. have a bit of, bit of giggling at the end. So thank you ever so much for being brave enough to come on and share your story today. And, yeah, it... it I knew you before, but I didn't know your story. And so this has been enlightening and informative and kind of humbling to listen to because so much love, so much hope, and ultimately to lose it all. And I'm, I, I think it speaks volumes about your character that you have been able to put yourself back out there and, and find love again. And I genuinely think that's probably because of the love that Adam poured into you. I you mean, 
a lot, like you say, with the love you have for your children, obviously all the love that you have is immense and it goes on and on and on. It's very different for different people in your life. But you can, you know, you don't have less love. It expands and it grows. Yeah. It, 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 we are we are very capable of loving more than once in a lifetime. And non-widow people don't necessarily understand that, but it doesn't take away or tarnish anything from the, the love that you felt. And yeah. we, we, in fact, I'm in the process of having my, I've suddenly felt this pull to wear my wedding and engagement ring from Ben. So after the bank holiday, I'm going to pop to the jewellers and see if I can have it made into something different with it because I just, I don't know, I feel this pull to, to still wear it. Yeah. And I haven't done, but suddenly it's back. Yeah. Wait. So are you so, getting a tattoo, did you say? I am getting, well, I'm booked in for one. There's still a fairly high chance I'll bottle it. But yes, I am. Um, the card that we send out to our guests has the Latin noli temere, which uh, my pronunciation is probably not perfect. And loose, it means do not be afraid. And I, I quite like those sort of text sailor tattoos, the swallows, yeah. cars, things. So I think I'm going to have, I think I'm going to have a midlife crisis tattoo. I'm going to have yeah. one. I, I may share it. So let's, but let's see yeah. how it. Goes. Um, yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's that's good. I, I desperately want some more, but it's that. What is it, and where is it going to be, sort of thing. But more yeah. feathered dude when he quite soon after he died on my wrist which I I, I love very much because I can see it all the time but so, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm doing all sorts of crazy shit at the moment why not get a massive tattoo exactly. <laughs> I think this year is particularly weird because um Chris and I just had our six year anniversary I can't believe it even when I say yeah. it um, and it, it's longer than just longer than Adam and I gosh so that very strange feeling mm. Which I don't dwell on too much, to be honest, because it doesn't really, time doesn't really mean that much in the grand scheme of things. But it is that, oh gosh, we are now at that point. So it's, yeah, it's very well, I think ben in, older than Ben, uh, very difficult. And, and actually the birthday party we were at yesterday was for Sarah's sister, who's just turned 40. Yeah, yeah that was lovely. Sorry, that. Uh, yeah. but, but I really, it had brought up so much grief for her because she was her older sister and she didn't get to turn 40 and she wasn't yeah. there to make a fuss of her. So we, we tried very hard to make the, the fuss of her that Sarah would have made. Yeah, that's beautiful, that, all those photos. Yeah. Good, I love my my crazy blended patchwork life, yeah. you know. It's yeah. like it's the one I chose, but it's the one I got and I'm embracing it. So Yeah, definitely. Anyway, Laura, I suppose I better let you get back to your Easter Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's been on a bit longer than I thought, but oh, do you know what? Well, it's I've been got... so good to do again. It's and I actually I could do this every week if you're up for it. Then <laughs> yeah, we just book it. Yeah, book it yeah. Okay. Laura, I may get you back in to do one of our wash ups anyway because I'm going to talk think about bringing in some guests. So I will definitely be in touch. Um, I, and I, you know, I hope that we continue to stay in touch and and yeah. meet in person one day. That'd be lovely. Thank you once again for, for being part of this. We do so appreciate it, Laura. Take care. All right. Take care, Lorenzini. Bye. 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 Goodbye, everybody. Thank you ever so much for listening. Thank you for listening today. We'll be back with you soon for more from the front line of loss. But for now, as you were. <laughs>